Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I've, I've been having a ball up here tonight because uh, I've been learning. I'm a, I'm a real buff on the history of AA. I could listen to it all night. And of course, in America here, we're very number one conscious, you know, numero uno. And up until last year, when Marty M, Marty M passed away, she was the uh, first woman sober in our program, successfully. And as far as Sybil knows, and as far as uh, some of us know here at the table, she's uh, uh, Sybil is the oldest. I don't know how to phrase this. The oldest <laughs> living uh, female member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, without any further ado. I'll introduce Sybil C. from Pasadena. Hi, everybody. My name is Sybil, and uh, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm Bob's wife. (laughs) (laughs) Also, I think I better do it the way I uh, usually do because I was asked to. But I did that for Bob's benefit. That's a, that's a family end joke, and he'll, he'll listen to the tape. My name is really Sybil Doris Adams Stratton Hart Maxwell <laughs> Willis, <laughs> and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> And a real ding-a-ling about doing the proper thing at the proper time, so I brought the program with me so that I could read the names of some of the people that I'm grateful to for being able to be here, and among them is Joy and Bonnie and Carol and Nell and Mike and Greg and Diane and Tom Moore and, oh, my God, so many more, but I can't talk all night about all the people that have been so good to me. Oh, Connie, who zipped me up, she said, if I can help you, uh, she told me last night going down the hall, if I can do anything for you at all, let me know. Room 225, so tonight I couldn't get this dress on without Bob. I didn't have a pair of pliers with me. So I called her, and she came down and helped. And you know, those things are very meaningful to me. To me, that is medicine that'll make you strong when things aren't going well. The people of Alcoholics Anonymous have been so good to me that I truly think it is the greatest medicine on earth. I even told someone tonight that uh, uh, Greg and Fred met me at the airport and so lovingly took me directly to my room and left uh, word at the desk that I was to receive no messages until I took the the ban off so that I could get some sleep since Bob has been so sick. And, uh, you know, uh, being alone in a room and not being with the people is, was just dim dandy, but I didn't really sleep, but I did lay down. But today, I had fits going there early in the afternoon because I was thought I was supposed to, and instead I was almost a raving maniac because I wanted to be here instead, and I was missing <laughs> that, and I, was, and I got tireder and tireder, and, and I took a bath, and I took another bath, and... I got dressed too soon, and I paced up and down. I wore myself out in that room that last hour and a half. And so just in case you think that 40 and a half years of sobriety made me a saint, I ain't. <laughs> I'm a real emotional nut, sober and grateful to be that way, but there are a lot of little things about me that I think you ought to know. Not that I want to take any hope away from you that make it 40, 50, or 60 years sober, which you surely will do. I've changed a lot, but I'll tell you some of the things I'm not. And that's the symbol of today. Don't be afraid of me. I mean, you newcomers don't be afraid of me because I'm nothing special at all. I, I'm a person who got sober a heartbeat at a time, and the last few days I've been doing it again. And that's how I had to do it in the beginning. A heartbeat at a time of day was too long. Now, I wasn't thinking of getting drunk today or yesterday or the day before and all the months before this, good or bad, and it's been bad lately on account of Bob's illness, naturally, and a lot of other aggravations. 
But just the same, the program for me is something that I latch on to as a life-saving medicine that you can get from any member you walk into or call up on the phone, and it'll do more for you than any doctor ever could. And I've always believed that. But instead of growing and growing and growing and getting better and better and better as the years went by, uh, there are some of the things about the old Sybil that still hang around. Uh, speaking of being an emotional nut, I, I, it was only at my 40th uh, AA birthday at the Pacific Group that uh, Clancy started that I revealed this about myself because I wanted you to think I was perfect, maybe. Maybe that's why I didn't. But... I told them there that when I was drinking, I was a rotten housekeeper. And then I stopped for a minute and I said, and I still am. <laughs> and I said, it is the most monotonous, unrewarding thing that has to be done over and over and over <laughs> infinitum, forever. <laughs> So I said, I haven't uh, made too much headway because Bob and I are like in this respect. We love animals. And so when they come to our door crawling from hunger, Bob called me on the phone from downstairs. He has a cabinet shop down on the level and we live up a mountain. And he said, bring a can of dog food down here. Well, we only had three dogs then. He says, it's a starving dog that can't walk. He said, I'm going to take it in the garage and, and bring a can of dog food. So I flew down 35, 40 steps with a big, tall can of cow can. We fed the dog. We lifted him up in his arms, put him in their backyard. And there he stayed until yesterday. We took him to the hospital. I think he was poisoned or something. We had him two or three years. And the day before, the other German shepherd into the hospital. That's all trying to get, trying to get here to Reno. And so we keep these dogs plus two little spitzes that have hair that long and it's molting time for them now. And I will vacuum, and in four hours, with the overhead big bladed fan that we have, it drifts this snow into the corner where you think you've done a perfect job, you go over and you pick it up by the hand. You could stuff a pillow with it. You really could. And that's just the way it is around my house. Um, like I told him down at the Pacific Group, I said, I don't mind telling you about this, but I just hate for you to see it. <laughs> I said, for instance, we have a lovely boat, uh, buffet, needs refinishing. Our house is shabby. Bob is a remodels home for other people, but hasn't gotten around to doing anything to ours. And I said, sitting on the buffet are some lovely Bavarian china dishes and whatnots in the dish cupboard that I polish every six months, Christmas or Thanksgiving. And, but I said, they're sitting there, and all of a sudden I look in one of those pretty bowls, and there'll be a paper clip, um, one stamp, a stub of a pencil, and the dog's ball. <laughs> and I look at that, and I go to the other bowls on the sideboard, and there's odd mints of various kinds there, but only one of a kind. <laughs> And then I'll go to my china cupboard that Bob's mother has given me some priceless china that I love so much. And each little china cup will have something that I wanted to remember that I won't forget where I put this. <laughs> and it'll be a button. Also, before you won't have to buy 20 more or something like that. And the whole thing, I, I get them all out because they're going to clean up real good because one of my babies is going to come over and I want them to love me. And I, I get this, uh, I take all these oddments out of all the bowls and dishes and lay them out, and there's not two of a kind. Now, how do you, where do you put them? So I have a junk drawer. And I go out in the kitchen, and the junk drawer is about that wide, and it can't open it anymore, it's so full. And I stuff them all in there. When it gets too full, I empty the junk drawer and put everything in a hefty bag. <laughs> put the hefty bag in the basement and I'll take care of that tomorrow. <laughs> so I told my friends down south, we love you, we want you, and we'll make coffee for you, but give us an hour's grace and I'll get out a hefty bag and I'll get rid of all that stuff. <laughs> I said, otherwise I couldn't come to your meeting and talk. 
because I've been sober over 40 years and I didn't get here a teenager. I got here when I was 32, going on 33 the next month, and I will be 74 my next birthday. I said, I can't do all that stuff and wax and polish and go to a meeting and talk. <laughs> So that's the real Sybil, <laughs> trying to be entirely honest and not being just a people pleaser. And I love you so much for understanding. I, don't, I bet all the women alcoholics in this room left home with a clean house. <laughs> I got one now because my daughter left Hollister, came down to take care of Bob. I called there this afternoon and he's sponsoring a doctor who's been sober 10 or 12 years. And the doctor just happened to drop by from Orange County, only 35 miles, <laughs> and spent the afternoon with Bob, and I know why he did it, to look after Bob so Sib would be happy. Now, isn't that wonderful? I don't have to worry about a thing. There's a, there's a doctor in the house. <laughs> Great. Oh, I was so lucky to find AA when I did. I was such a mean kid. And I started drinking when I was 15, against my better judgment, because my parents were so religious and stern and strict. And they had talked so much against alcohol that I couldn't, I wanted to see what it tasted like. And I got a chance when I was about 15 or 16, I don't remember which. I drank the whole thing and fell insensible to the ground and had to be carried home and put in Mama's bed came to and said, I'll never do it again. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. So sorry. And 17 years or more of the same and five husbands. Begging for forgiveness from every direction. Guilt, 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 and I won't do it again. I was a Jill of all trades. I left school at an early age. My parents were poor people, and I left school at 15. I took a short-term business course. I was in high school at the time. I didn't finish the course. Got a typewriter and uh, taught myself to be a legal secretary, and I was really good at that. And that's about when my drinking got started and uh, really bad, and all the guilt with it, and the remorse and the stigma of being a woman drunk, because secretly... I didn't know anyone else was like that. And what I wanted to do was get married and have a baby and be a good wife and mother. Well, the depression came along, and I found out that my brother Tex was an alcoholic. And he didn't know that I was one. We were hiding it from each other. And we bumped into each other and found out that we both were drunks and we drank together from then on. Big 280-pound Texan. He'd watch me drink, and I'd watch him drink. I'd bail him out of jail 89 times, and he would say, you've got to cut out that stuff, Sid, because you can't handle it like me. <laughs> You're going to die a drunk. <laughs> well, he got arrested and was in jail, and uh, I'd been bootlegging with him down on Skid Row, along with my ups and downs and my station in life, you know. Uh, I'd do, uh, have a good job, and then Skid Row with Tex, whatever he did, I did. So at this particular time, he was in jail, and Mama was taking care of my baby. That's another story. I was married to an alcoholic that didn't know he was one, and he abandoned me when she was six months old, and I had my mother take her, and she kept her because I couldn't. And I didn't know what to do for money. Now, Tex was in jail, and we couldn't bootleg, so I went across the street and got a job as a taxi dancer and uh, got real drunk to be able to do that. And that night, a real handsome guy walked in and took a shine to me, and uh, he bought all the tickets for the evening. And uh, during intermission, we'd go out uh, where they serve pitchers of beer, and I'd get a buck a pitcher uh, for that, besides my dime a dance stuff. Oh, shades of Ruth Eddings, ten cents a dance. <laughs> and I told my sad tale about wanting to be a good wife and mother, and Mama kept the baby, and they wouldn't let me have her, but I supported her, and uh, I wanted to sober up and not bring her. I don't want to behave like this. He says, oh, you poor little thing. A nice little girl like you doesn't belong in a place like this. He said, imagine your husband abandoning you when the baby was born. Well, the poor guy was a drunk, and, and it was during the Depression, and he couldn't find work, so he just cut out. He just split. He says, I can fix all that. I have money and you need security. I'll adopt your baby and I'll raise her as my own. He said, let's get married. And I says, let's do. <laughs> and then 
most awful thing happened. He kept his word. He supported that baby. He adopted that baby. But I was drunk in a week after we were married, and he had to hunt me up, find me, drag me kicking and screaming into the back seat of the car and take me home and take care of me for 17 years while that little girl was growing up. And I didn't want to behave like that. I didn't feel like that inside. I didn't want to do that. But I did. And I went through all this stuff alone because I'd, I'd do this away from my brother Tex because I was so ashamed. And then I'd get to be a fighting drunk in a bar and I'd go home with a black eye and, and, and cuts inside my mouth so where somebody had punched me out at the bar. I don't know what I said to him. At a certain stage of drinking, I was a fighting drunk, that was all. And I'd wonder what I said so they'd clip me one, you know. And the next morning I'd look at my car to see if the windshield was busted or if I'd killed somebody. I'd had no idea. Black house and driving home from the bar, I'd, I'd hear these voices saying, Sybil, 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 Sybil. And I'd say, huh? There wasn't anybody there. I'd get to my house and I'd, I'd crawl up the steps and tear my nylons and beat on the door to let me in, let me in, lock the doors, they're after me. And oh, that was frightening. And I tried again to quit and couldn't. It was scary. And Dick, Dick, the good man that he was, the finest man that ever lived, he was a saint. He finally said, I'm going to have to take this child and leave because I don't want her to be brought up this way with a drunken mother. And I knew he meant it. I went on my last drunk, drove up to San Francisco, and I don't know how I got there. I was afraid to come back, and I wanted to go home. I really did. But I was afraid to because I didn't think I'd have one. So I sobered up in a Turkish bath just so that I could tell him a good lie if he was there with my daughter. And sobering up, I picked up the Saturday evening post just to turn my head off. And on the cover it said, Alcoholics Anonymous by Jack Alexander. That was March 1st, 1941. And I was too sick to read it, but the pictures told me a story. On the, the first picture was of a man lying in bed. No, he was in a stretcher. And he was being put in an ambulance. Uh, so as sick as I was, I certainly did conclude right then and there that uh, it, it was a cure. They took him to the AA hospital. <laughs> and they gave him a little box of pills, and then he could have one a day and behave and drink, too, you know, or something. And that was okay. I turned the page, and then the next one, the man was in bed, and, and two guys sitting with him. And I'm going to ask Ruth Hopp someday, Bill's secretary. Was that Dr. Bob and Bill sitting there by the bed? I don't know yet. But that impressed me, and I said, yes, sir, it's an AA hospital. So I wrote for a letter. I wrote a letter for help, and I mailed it, which was the first miracle, because I told you there was never anything like that all handy. Where was I going to get a stamp and an envelope and a piece of paper? All three? I did. And I wrote the letter, and I said, I'm a desperate woman drunk. And I'll take the next plane back to New York and take your cure. And Ruth Hawk answered me, a little non-alcoholic secretary that worked for Bill and Hank Parkhurst, his partner in little auto accessories business, and they didn't have a nickel. And they paid Ruth $25 a week, and when they didn't have that, they gave her stock in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> So I got a, an answer right away. Now, you know, her job didn't start out that big because she'd work for them and, and answer an occasional phone call from somebody locally and refer them to Bill and, or Dr. Bob or somebody. But when that Saturday evening post hit, thousands of letters came in, and Ruth had to answer them all, and she had to get some volunteers. Bill called her Dutch, and he'd say, Bill, a, a Dutch, how many letters did we get today from the Saturday evening post? And she'd say, I mailed a lot of them out to California. And I'll say she did. One of them was my letter, and she answered it, and she said, You don't have to come back to New York to find help. You've got AA there in California. It started in a small way, December 19, 1939, with four men in a hospital. Kay Miller, non-alcoholic woman from New York whose husband didn't get sober, but Kay had the big red book. Happened to be going to Hawaii, stopped off in Los Angeles, and gave it to Judge Ben Lindsay, who took it over to the General Hospital. And there, a young psychologist by the name of Johnny Howe took it to his 
four worst blocks and said, you want to read this? And they said, yeah, and they read it. And they said, but it doesn't tell us what to do or how to start a group. And one of them said, yes, it does. It tells you how it's been. Let's just read that. And so they read that. Then they met at one of the guys' homes in Pasadena, and the wife objected. She said, I don't want a bunch of drunks walking up my steps. So they met in hotel lobbies or in the mezzanine, anywhere they could meet free, and they read this, how it works. That's all they did, read how it works. You know, we're like kids in school because we still read it because they did. And now it's read everywhere. And they grew and they dwindled because they'd get a 12-step call to go see a drunk. A couple, of them, a couple of them would go out to see the drunk and get drunk with them. <laughs> and so when I came in at 41, there were approximately 12 men sober from 39 to 41. My non-alcoholic husband drove me down there. Ruth told us where to go. But I was, I pulled a sack over my head figuratively, and when we went into that room at the Elks Temple, it was just one table like this, only um, long enough to hold a dozen guys, I guess. And I made myself invisible, and I was shaking, and my palms were bleeding, and I was jerking, and I had a nervous tick, and my calm husband sat there, and we just didn't know what they were going to do. I thought they were doctors, maybe, that were going to give him a prescription. I did not know. Man got up at the end of the table. He said, this is a regular meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in California. We're a band of ex-drunks who gather together to obtain and maintain our sobriety on an all-time basis with no mental reservations whatsoever. And I thought, my God, what an order. I can't go through with it. <laughs> And then I got mad, as sick as I was. I thought, they have passed a pledge around this table before I got here and everybody signed that thing, and they can't make me sign that. <laughs> I've signed plenty of those. And then he says, but as is our custom before the regular meeting starts, uh, the women will have to leave. And he pointed to the side door and said, leave quietly and we'll start our regular Friday meeting. And I looked at the table, I just saw men, and I thought, that's a polite way of throwing out a bloodshot, eyed, twitchy, broad, bloated. They're throwing me out. So I put my hands over my face and I went out in that huge lobby. And I cried and wrung my hands and stayed in the ladies' room. And I would walk back and forth wringing my hands. And my saintly husband sat in there and they thought he was a newcomer and they really gave it hell. <laughs> they really, they talked to him about think, 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 easy does it, put a nickel in the telephone, don't take the first drink. He's sitting there, he doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> and they had come from wherever they lived in California to go to that meeting because that's all they had. One guy from San Bernardino, Kent Hayden, another guy from Santa Barbara, I don't remember his name. Jim Shea from Hanford, kind of up close to Fresno. And Mel Tricky from Orange County, a real estate broker, and a few of our local boys. All right, now that's AA, and they only have it once a week Friday. Do you think they close the meeting in an hour, an hour and a half? No. Went on for years, I think. <laughs> it seemed to me. But when the doors opened and I saw Dick, I ran over and I said, Give me my prescription and let's go home. He said, They don't know you're alive. <laughs> he said, All they did is brag about how much they drank and where they drank, and I don't know why they kept looking at me all the time. <laughs> So I screamed and hooped and hollered, and we went home, and I went under the steering wheel and started the motor and ran to the nearest bar and got drunk in 86, and the bartender couldn't put up with me, and I, then I remembered the magic letter from Ruth. It was in my purse. I had wanted to get a chance to present my credentials, and I never, they didn't give me a chance. So I thought, now's the time. <laughs> And I was terribly drunk. So I put a nickel in the telephone at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I called the number that Ruth had given me. She P.S. She said, if you need help, call Cliff Walker. Read your AA comes of age. You'll find out that Cliff answered the phones for AA until 1944 when the central office started in Los Angeles. No big deal at first, you know. So he answered the phone. He was a poor boy, a milkman, and he was getting ready to leave. And I said, thinking of that Saturday evening post, I said, send your AA. Ambulance and pick me up. <laughs> he said, You're drunk. I said, Of course. 
<laughs> you would be too if you'd got thrown out of that exclusive club where I was tonight. I tried to get help and they threw me out. I went down to that meeting. The home office told me to do that. And they threw me out. Oh, he said, yeah, there's a mistake. They don't do that. Did you tell them you were an alcoholic? I said, tell them I'm an alcoholic. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, you should have. You should have told them you'd have been welcome as a flowers in May. Now, you go home and I'll call them up. I can't go to their night meetings now because I'm a milkman. I have one in my home Sunday afternoons. But I'll call them up and tell them a, a woman drunk will be there next Friday. Now, that's a week away. I said, young man, I've had enough of this. I have a letter of authority of authorization from New York which should have entitled me to every consideration. I got none down there. I'm getting none from you, and I'm going home for one reason only, and that is to call New York and have you fired. <laughs> and I was haughty, and I was indignant, and I was mad. So I crawled home. I couldn't even get up. I was so drunk. I lived two blocks away. And um, I was mad. But I went back. I went back because my brother Tex went with me out of curiosity. He was down on Skid Row on the bum again. He was either rich, and I mean rich, talented man, or down on Skid Row. Rich, down on Skid Row again. And he came over and he read the pamphlet and he said, there's a gimmick, this is a money maker, and I'm going to. And I said, oh, you can't. Because they, they won't let you in if you're not an alcoholic. And you say you're a social drinker. You can't go. <laughs> Do you know what a, a drunk would say if you told him that? He said, the hell I can't. They won't know I'm not a drunk because they can't smell booze on my breath that night. I'm going to go down there and find out how they're making all that dough and I, maybe I can get rich again. And I said, he said, I'm, there won't be any booze on my breath. I'll make that deal with you. But there's more to this than meets the eye. So he was peddling vegetables down you know, from Produce Row, and the winos were all in Lincoln Heights, and he couldn't get a full crew together, and he thought he'd help out to get them sober if there was anything to this. So I said, well, okay. <laughs> so the following Friday night, he pulled up to my house in a vegetable truck, and they were standing up in back were 11 winos. <laughs> <laughs> and we all go down to the mother group together. <laughs> They'd put a few chairs together out in front, and there were more of us than there were of them. <laughs> I know what they said because I was so afraid Tex, talented man, I was afraid he'd raise his hand and say, my good man, I beg to differ with you on this point, and I was afraid he'd do something terrible and get me thrown out again. But he was so quiet, didn't say a word. Frank Randall got up there, and he brought up um, about 500... 12 step calls that had been mailed by Ruth that got there that time, see, at my real first meeting. And he said, hear this, hear this, there's about 512 step calls here that have to be made by next Friday or some of those drunks are going to die. They've been forwarded from New York. So, I'm going to call, call off this room by district. Is there anybody here from Orange County? Here, well, come up here and get this bundle of letters. He had them tied up with rubber bands, about 40 or 50 in each one. And then he'd say, anybody here from uh, Riverside County? Here. And then Kent Hayden took his. Curly O'Neill took Long Beach. Got down to the few local boys. Got them all handed out. And he says, remember this, go see them. Because one could die in a week. They deserve their chance. But I've got one more bundle here. <laughs> They're all from women. We've got a woman alcoholic now. Her name is Sybil. Cliff Walker told me she might be here. You are Sybil, aren't you? And I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He said, well, get up here and take these 12-step calls. I've saved them for the last. They're all from women. And I, it was the most awful journey I ever made. I, I got up there. He looked like a senator, handsome, tall, well-dressed senator. And I was short, and he was tall. And I said, I can't, sir. He said, why the hell not? I said, because I'll be drunk next Friday. <laughs> I said, unless there's some kind of a miracle that, you, that something's going to happen now, right here at this meeting, it's going to change me because I haven't been sober over nine days since I was 15 or 16. And I said, I, you could see the blood, you see me shaking, you see my nervous t twitch, which I've had for six months, and uh, you've got to do something tonight or I will not 
put myself in this position of taking this responsibility, you said somebody might die. And I don't want to be the one that would cause that. Is there something going to happen here tonight that will keep me sober now? And there was a kind of a pause, and he said, yes. Yes, I, if you want to call it a miracle, uh, okay. But it's right here in the book, and that's all we've got here in California. I'll just read it to you. And he opened the big red book, and Bill put in there. When all other measures fail, working with another alcoholic will save the day. That's what you'll be doing. You punch the doorbell. The girl comes to the door. You give her the letter. Say, did you write it? She says, yes, I did. Say, well, I'm one. I'm hurting from booze. Are you? She says, yes. Say, come with me. And he says, bring her. (laughs) And don't tell her a thing because you don't know anything. I said, I can do that. And he said, if you do that, Bill says that getting uh, helping another drunk will keep you sober. It gets, has kept us sober. We had nobody from the East to come out here to tell us anything at all. We've been going, we've been in existence now since 1939. And all you have to do is help another drunk, and that's the basics of it. And in this book, it'll say that all the way through is help another drunk and that's the basics of it and in this book it'll say that all the way through he said you see Bill had to start somewhere and there wasn't another drunk to talk to and he found them wherever he could down on the Bowery and in jails and everywhere else till he finally after talking to 75 of them he went home and he said Lois I'm going to give it up my idea has failed I'm a failure Nobody's sober. And Lois said, Oh, Bill, you're a great success. You've been sober six months. And he said, By golly, Lois, you're right. I won't give it up. And then he got, he went to Akron right after that. And what happened? He met Dr. Bob. And at last he had somebody to talk to. And they did. They clung to each other day and night. And he lived in Dr. Bob's house there with him. Oh, I just get goosebumps when I think about that. Two of them. I was at Founder's Day and went to Dr. Bob's house and plucked grass off the front lawn. It's abandoned now. It should be a shrine or something. It shouldn't be torn down, which I'm sure it is. And the Mayfair Hotel and all that. And I plucked grass to bring back and just hand out a blade at a time to my best friends. I I was so moved, and I went and I saw his grave and all that. But getting back to this bill, and Dr. Bob went over to the hospital and visited the drunks there. And you know about Sister Ignatia, if you've read all the history of AA. She'd smuggle in the drunks, and Bill and Dr. Bob would talk to them. And they had no name. They had no program except the basics of the Oxford group, which they had been following. No steps, no traditions, no group. They finally got a group in Bill's home and in Dr. Bob's home, and they clung together, these two little bunches of people comparing notes. And they kept sober. And it was three years and a half later that they decided they'd better have a name because they wanted to write a book and get rich. (laughs) And they tossed the names in the hat, the exit, and a hundred men. And then Ruth Hawk's uh, housekeeper came in, Florence Rankin. Her chapter was in the first big red book. And they said, we can't call it a hundred men because we got Florence now. But she didn't make it and she died drunk. And then you know about Marty coming in. But anyway... The big book was finally published, and that's when we got our name, Alcoholics Anonymous. And they made it, and they made it by helping another. And Frank was a strong-minded man and strong-spoken man, and he said, Sybil, get your mind off yourself and help somebody else and come back here next Friday, and you'll learn as you go. And in the meantime, you'll be sober. 
and you'll be helping somebody else and not thinking all the time about that drink. And that's exactly what happened. But my brother Tex went with me, thank God. I didn't know he was hurting. He was such a loud mouth protesting too much. And then the roof caved in. We had no traditions. So we started making the most terrible mistakes. Uh, we had, uh, like, uh, Pete Cunningham sat here uh, somewhere near, and uh, Frank would say, Now, when I pass out all this mail from New York, you guys come up here and get your medication to give to those guys because we got to get them down here, and if they're too shaky, give them one of those Nimbutal. And if they're too bad, well, I give them a little shot of peraldehyde, but get them here, and we'll, you know... And so Tex and I went up, and we got our two little yellow pills and a little jug of peraldehyde and went forth and with it. And the first old man we called on couldn't, uh, you know, he was just shaking so bad we couldn't get him to the meeting. And so Bob, uh, so he said, where's that little jug, Jeb? My brother Tex said, let's just give him a few drops of peraldehyde. So we did. And the guy got a little quieter, and he said, well, maybe one of those yellow pills would help. And so we gave him one of those. And Tex says, well, look at him. He's quiet. <laughs> and he said, well, old timer, we'll be back here at 7.30 and pick you up and take you to the meeting. But he couldn't go. He, he, he was stoned. <laughs> we got to the meeting that night, and Frank opened the meeting, and he said, hear this, hear this. One of our members gave somebody a little slug of peraldehyde and a pill today to get him sober, and his ticker stopped. We had to call an ambulance. We've got him over here in the hospital, and they brought him to, and he's going to be all right. But this teaches us a lesson. From now on, he says, first of all, I'll tell you what happened. We got the guy over at the hospital, and we found out we are not doctors. We're not going to play doctor anymore. We're not going to play nurse. We're not going to give them any medication. If they're that sick, go over and dump them at the emergency entrance of the county hospital and run like hell. No, 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 you know, no place to take them. And that's all we did. We did do that. We'd take them over there and leave them. And so he says, we can't do that because we can kill people. We don't want to do that. We want to get them well. So no more pills. No, and, and while I'm at it, he says, I better add two more things. This is not an unemployment agent. This is not an employment agency. You guys quit asking around here for jobs because we're not going to get you any work. And this is a place where some of you guys are going to play Little Red Riding Hood and the Wolf. And he says, I don't think much of that, but you aren't going to pay any attention to me about that. It will ever be thus because the women are going to come in and you guys are going to chase them and some of them are going to get drunk and you oughtn't to do that and get emotionally involved for a year. And you know all this good stuff. But he said, from now on, no medication. We're going to carry the message of AA, and if they want it, if they want to get sober, bring them. And that's what we did. And we grew so fast that we had a, an auditorium uh, right away at 2200 West 7th Street, and my brother Tex started his own group, The Hole in the Ground, and no traditions, they excommunicated him from AA <laughs> and incorporated AA in California to keep Tex Adams out and showed him the papers. And he laughed. And he said, you might as well try to incorporate a sunset. He said, I'll lay you eight to five that in six months we'll have groups all over California. And he was right. But they stayed mad about a year and then everybody laughed it all off and that was okay. But the thing of it was, when Frank called me up with that stack of letters from the women, he added this statement, which I think was a classic. He said, we've got a woman alcoholic, her name is Sybil, and I'm going to put her in charge of all the women. This was in my first meeting. <laughs> and I, my mind in 10 seconds did all this. I looked and I could see a neon sign that went to that room saying, Sybil's in charge. Sybil's in charge. And I thought... I was thrown out last week, and now I'm in charge. <laughs> Boy, I got a promotion in a hurry. I couldn't, I just didn't, I couldn't understand why it was, I mean, it was so important. They'd pat me on the head and say, how long you been sober now, Sib? Nine days. That's good, you know, that's all I needed. And the 12 steps kept me sober. And we began throwing other people out. They tried to throw Tex out, and he'd just come back when he got ready. But he said, I'm too busy with my own group. I probably won't be down here very much anyway, and he wasn't. So I was in charge of the women, and I had my little book. And I would go to the meeting, and there were about 40 women in then, and, and there would be the sponsor and sitting right by the, the sponsee. Yep, that checks off. The system that Frank gave me, you know, and I adored him. 
And, uh, yeah, there's Susie and there's Mary, sponsor and sponsee. That's the call I put out. Yep, crossed that one off. And, and it balanced out just perfect. Twenty sponsors and twenty sponsees. <laughs> and I was so proud of being able to keep a record of the women. And everybody was directed to call Sybil if it's a woman. And it just worked beautiful until after a while one night when the group was about as, almost as big as this one, and I was going to the hole in the ground out there at Texas on other night, the other night, I saw a woman walk in with six women that hadn't been cleared through me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I walked clear to the back of the room. I couldn't believe it, such rebellion. And I said, Kay, where'd you get these women? <laughs> well, she said they live in Culver City, where I do, and we used to play cards together and drink together, and they've been watching me stay sober, and they asked if they could come and get sober too, and I said, yes, and here they are. And I have one more thing to say, Sybil. I'm never going to report to you again. <laughs> and I got my nervous twitch back. <laughs> and that hurt, really hurt, really badly. And I went out to the hole in the ground and cried on Texas' shoulder. And he said, honey, you go down there and make up a pretty little speech and you resign because they're going to throw you out too. <laughs> and so I resigned just in the nick of time. And... and and then we, cho you know, chose up sides and some for Sybil and some for the new secretary. And that was all terribly exciting, too. So we stayed sober partly on excitement and part on on making mistakes. And it, it was so rewarding to me um, when, when Frank said, we now have a woman alcoholic and her name is Sybil. And how long have you been sober, Sybil? And I said that, you know. And he said, welcome. And he did that. And he says, and you may, he said, Open the meeting, even this way, he said. Now, this is a regular meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in California. The time has come to ask all of the non-alcoholics to leave the room. But are, if there are any women present who choose to call themselves alcoholics, they may remain. And I folded my arms, and I grinned, and I thought, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> And, of course, as I told you, that was on March 23rd, 1941, and I haven't had to drink since. Not even a, a you know, an eyedropper fall. <laughs> or any cough syrup, none of that stuff, you know. But a day at a time, a heartbeat at a time, and making a lot of mistakes, and there were lots of ups and downs and glorious times and bad times and good times because we're human beings. And I thought because I was an alcoholic and sober in AA that... Uh, that everything would come up roses for the rest of my life. It, it was inconceivable to me that it could be otherwise. You know? What time does that say? I couldn't believe that these people loved me because I loved me, and it took me a long time to realize that they didn't expect too much from me. They only wanted me to stay sober. They wanted to watch me grow. They didn't expect me to be perfect. But I didn't, I'm not, a, I'm such a slow learner. I really am. Now, one of my babies, um, her name was Alma Majora. It was a gorgeous lady that had been in show business, and she wore long curly eyelashes, you know, with mascara, and everything matched, fuchsia. And, uh, uh, lavender together, uh, all those things I know nothing about. I've never been a very snappy dresser. My daughter has to check me out, and like, Connie checked me out tonight, because I'm kind of half colorblind and blind. <laughs> and, so here she is, and we wear hats. You gotta wear a hat to the meeting, like Sunday school teachers. And, one night, I'm at the meeting, and I throw my coat back over the chair because it's hot, and the lining is pinned together with a safety pin, and I didn't give a damn. I had lost the power to care how I looked. And Alma said casually, are you going to be home tomorrow, Sybil? And I said, yeah. She said, I'm coming over with a needle and thread and, and fix the lining in your coat. Well, I was overcome with embarrassment. I thought, that i I got to do better than that. And I started to shape up a little bit. And I began to get a little more self-respect and self-esteem, of which I'd never had any for so long. And those little lessons meant a great deal to me. And now I lived in this beautiful home that I really did try to work on hard because it was a pleasure at that time. When Dick and I were married, we lived in this beautiful home and Alma Majora lived in a gorgeous home in Westwood and I was still people-pleasing and wanting Alma to think her sponsor was the most wonderful and perfect woman in the world. And Alma called up one day 
And she said, my husband and I are in your neighborhood, and we know about that lovely home that you uh, are now living in, and uh, we would like to stop by and see it. And this was a long time after that time she pinned the safety pin. And uh, she says, we're just two blocks from your house. Can we drop by and see it? I said, oh, of course. And I go in the kitchen, which is a big, long kitchen, has a sink as long as this table, blue and white tile and blue and white linoleum to match. And on this sink, from one end to the other, were dirty dishes. <laughs> well, I got them all, opened all the cupboard doors, um, before, and I began throwing them in the cupboard from one end to the other, and shutting the doors. And then the pots and pans were left on the stove and I opened the oven, and I threw them all in there, just as the doorbell rang. And I walked down the hall to the entry hall and opened the door. And I said, come in and have a cup of coffee. Go in the step-down living room there and be seated, and I'll bring it to you, and I'll have it made in a minute. And Alma said, oh, no, I'll go help you. <laughs> and she went in the kitchen to get the cups, and they all fell out on her. <laughs> and I was a sensitive alcoholic then, and I am now, and that, that bothered me a lot, but she laughed till I thought she'd have hysterics. And there was another little lesson that I had to learn. I just couldn't believe that this could happen to me. Things like that. Well, my brother Tex, the hole in the ground was so successful, it was a kindergarten. We began to uh, talk a lot about the steps. And that was about all we talked about there. And I went to the mother group less and less, and I stayed there, but still Tex kept pounding away at me to take the inventory, and I wouldn't do it, and I took one in secret and wouldn't let him know. And then one night, a guy came down to the hole in the ground that couldn't stay sober, and he said to Tex, he had this magic touch with new people that I'll never have if I live to be 100, and that won't be too long. And uh, <laughs> this guy said, everybody else stays sober working the steps, and I think I've missed one. Uh, would you tell me, Tex, which one I've missed? And Tex says, oh, it's too hot in here. It's July or August. Let's wait till the crowd leaves. We'll sit out on the steps. And um, I've got a reputation for being rough when I have to be rough. And he did. And he had the reputation for being gentle when he needed to be gentle. I don't know how you get that gift. So we sat on the steps, and Joe says, well, fire away, Tex. Which step have I missed? And Tex said, well, let's start with number one. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives are come unmanageable. And it would seem to me that maybe you've missed that one because, for the simple reason, that you seem to have reservations because you're always laughing around down here and sounding cute about your drinking, the funsy stuff. And he said, we didn't come here for fun. You might have some reservation about it, Joe. I don't think you've admitted you're powerless. And Joe said, thank you, Tex. That's just it, and I'll never forget that. And he got up to leave, and Tex said, sit down, Joe. We've just begun. We'll go to the second one. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And he says, we came to believe. We didn't have to believe when we came. And some get it right away. Some get it after they stay sober, and they will use a group, a book, a sponsor, or anything to stay sober for a while. We came to believe that's the way they wrote it. That's the way it is. But you brag about the fact that you wouldn't know God if he walked in the hole in the ground with, in a red nightgown. And he says, that's sacrilegious. You make fun of us. You brag about being an atheist, an agnostic. You oughtn't to do that, Joe. So you have not come close to the second step. You're not willing. Not willing to believe in anything, you know, like a sponsor, a group, or anything. So what are you going to do about the third one where we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him? We made this decision. It did not say we did it. We can make that decision a thousand times over, take our lives back again and make a decision again. It says we made a decision. And he says, I'm getting tired of the people at the hole in the ground coming up to me and saying, Tex, I've turned it over, I've turned it over, I've turned it over. Sure you have. Good for you. Turn it over again tomorrow if you have to. So he says, but you can't do that because you don't believe uh, in a higher power, if that's what you would like to call it, and you don't want to call it anything. So you can't even make that kind of a decision for the future. Now, we talk a lot about the inventory, and I've even had them hold their hands up at the hole in the ground and say, how many of you in here have taken a written inventory? And they all raise their hands, but you and my sister said, and I could have killed him. <laughs> now he says... 
You always say you got it all right up here in your head. You don't have to write anything down. Nobody can do that. Any woman can tell you that when she bakes a cake, she gets out the recipe, or she might leave out the soda or the baking powder or something. But it's a kind of a recipe. And when you say you can remember everything and you don't have to write it down, it just isn't so. Besides, if you believe in the program, all you have to do is pick up the book, and all the way through, it says we made a list, we made a list. Well, now, how are you going to make a list without a pencil or a pen? A list. And he says that list includes the inventory, and all you would have to do to get to feeling good in here is to get a matchbook cover or a little piece of paper that big and a pencil about that long and write down one thing that's bugging you and do something about it. And that's an inventory for that day. And do it again the next day as this stuff rises up in your mind. But keep it simple, but do it to show your willingness. That's the thing that counts. And so when we come to the fifth one, where we admitted to God, to ourselves, and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs, how are you going to admit uh, to a God you don't believe in the exact nature of your wrongs that you don't know what they are at all because you haven't taken an inventory, so uh, you're helpless. And the sixth one says we were entirely ready to be rid of these defects of character. What defects of character? They would be outlined in your inventory as you make progress. You see? But you won't make a list. You got it right up here, so you can't take that one. Seventh, we humbly ask him with a capital H. It's that same higher power. Three-letter word meaning God. Humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. You're not humble. You don't believe in him, and you don't even know what your shortcomings are because you haven't taken an inventory. So you're stuck out again. The eighth one and the ninth one are useless because one says we made a list. There it is again, made a list. You could have done that if you'd have started an inventory. You could have started that too. You made a list of all the persons you'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Ninth, we made direct amends to these people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. But you haven't made a list. And you just say, oh, I never hurt anybody but myself. And you know that's not so, we've all hurt someone down the line if we were drunk. So you struck out again. Joe, I think I've gone far enough because this is so embarrassing, this tenth one. We continued to take a personal inventory. <laughs> and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. And how are you going to continue to do something that you have never started and you're not even willing to start? Tech said, when I get to the eleventh one, I'm going to tell you something, Joe. I had to go get a dictionary to, because I, I didn't have a strong belief either. I don't have, didn't have the belief that I have now. And I looked up the word meditation and I found out that that was good, clean thinking. Thought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understand Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. And I found that Meditation was good, clean thinking, and that maybe a prayer could be for me at that time just a good thought for the girl or the guy sitting next to me. At least it was a start for me. And he said, now I have an acrobatic soul and I can pray standing up or sitting down or riding around in a car. It comes, it comes, buddy, if you stay sober. The twelfth one, having had a spiritual awakening, as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. You've not had a spiritual awakening, and you've never made a 12-step call, and that's the name of the game. So how can we say that you've practiced any of these 12 steps? Sorry, Joe. I hope I haven't offended you. And Joe Studden says, well, I didn't ask for all that text. <laughs> And he went out into the night and drank a long time, finally got back and sobered up, thank God. But do you know it was many years later that I realized that although Tex was talking to Joe, he was shooting at his sister, Seb. I never forgot the steps after that. I can hear things and, and can do things by listening to you better than I can read them, you know? So that's why about on my 40th birthday, March 23rd, I read the first seven chapters of the big book over again because I forget those things so quickly. And 
Bob is always discovering something really important in the book that he'd forgotten before. My Bob. He's a very spiritual man today. He was a hardcore atheist when he came to Alcoholics Anonymous, but he came to believe, and I was told tonight by someone precious that they've worn out three of his tapes that he made here in Reno four years ago when he spoke at the spiritual meeting Sunday morning. And I said, write that down. Let me take it home to him. Let him know that he helped somebody. It'll make him feel good. And of course it would. I love him so much. That man, he will never know. We've been married 15 years. That's, <laughs> that's not very long to be married to Bob. I want to make it 50 if I can. And so life goes on like that. Good and bad and good and bad. And it, it's just a miracle to be alive and well in Alcoholics Anonymous and know that all these, these wonderful people are behind you. But we make mistakes. When my brother Tex uh, died, I fell apart. He died at the hole in the ground. And uh, I couldn't cope. Somehow I couldn't cry, which was bad. And I couldn't cry. And I just went to the meetings every night and the room would be dark to me, although the faces were kind of familiar. And uh, they looked just like the people in the bar where I put nickels in the jukebox when I was searching for someone to help me. And they would try to help me and try to come over to my house to help me. And I I couldn't respond. Uh, yeah. Don't ask for an explanation. I, maybe it was a shock, a, a dreadful shock, because Papa died six weeks before that suddenly of a heart attack and then tax. So anyway, I would go. And I'd trudge in there and I'd sit at those meetings and everybody trying to help me. And it got so bad. I didn't think of a drink, but I knew I was going to die. And so I wrote a letter to Bill Wilson and I laid it out just as I told you. Tex and I and so many in Southern California knew Bill and Tex had visited him many times. And I wrote him and told him what I've told you and I said, I don't know what to do. I don't want to be like this. Life must go on. I don't want to drink. So how am I going to get over this? I haven't talked to anyone in the group and I can't right now. And he wrote me this letter. And the gist of it, the part that helped me the most, said, life is but a long day in school. Some of the lessons are hard and some of the lessons are easy. It's not so much what happens to us here. It's what we do with the experiences we have. It's the demonstration that counts. He said, in God's house there are many mansions, Seb, and this letter has stirred me more than anything in many a day. And the things you wrote me about your brother Tex, I know so well. But he said, somehow or other, I see Tex sitting on the porch of one of those mansions in the sunlight talking to another drunk. And that's the way it should be. But don't forget that life is a long day in school. Lessons are hard. Lessons are easy. And just keep on passing on what you have learned. And that will take care of everything. And he said, stay on the firing line of life and God will not abandon you and you will be protected from all harm. And if I've had anything to say tonight, that message meant so much to me. It's in this one, it's in that seven chapters of the big book. I think I quoted that firing line of life from the seven chapters I told you I read. And Bob and I look at that a lot because Making 12-step calls is such a joy, and that's the way they started. And I can highly recommend it to everyone in this room if you've been sober a day. Find some lonely, lost person in the back of the room that's shy and scared and might run away. And shake his hand and say, if you got a sponsor, Bob walks up to him like this when he sees somebody, you know. If you got a sponsor, are you new? Yeah, I'm new. My name is Bob. My name is Bob Corbin. And you haven't got a sponsor, huh? Well, you got one now. And uh, he even steals babies when he wants to. <laughs> so that's a good way. I mean, you don't have to get a call from a central office. You can steal one from somebody if you can't find one any other way. But do it. What if Bill or Bob had waited six months or a year to get sober before they made a call? I'm going to register a gripe and sit down. Some of the service offices make it necessary for an alcoholic to be sober one year before they'll let him register for a 12-step call, and I think it stinks. <laughs> and I wish somebody would listen to me about that. 
It's the only thing, I think it's the most important thing in the world that everybody be free to go see a sick drunk, and if you're afraid to go alone, take somebody with you. Nothing to it. You'll be so glad you did. It's the way to stay sober. I'm happy and I'm sober and I want to be back here when I'm 99 and that'll be in about 26 years. <laughs> and I'll be new then. I'm a newcomer because I'm here to learn from you. You have sustained me this weekend beyond anything that I had hoped. Believe it. Believe it. I'm glad I came. And this very trite thing that I've said before is something that I mean or I wouldn't close with this. It's just like, it seems to me anyway, that we're all fledglings learning to fly. And so as fledglings learning to fly, may the wings of your happiness never lose a feather. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.